Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Bin Shan uh, Hu for her uh, for her talk today. So Bin Shan uh, just recently joined Amy as one of our inaugural uh, postdoc fellows uh, just a couple of months ago, and she's co-hosted by myself and uh, Mark Schmidt from UBC. Uh, she recently completed her PhD just uh, last year from the University of Victoria under the supervision of Nishant Mehta. Uh, and her research um, lies in the theory side of machine learning, uh, looking into devising efficient and private online learning algorithms. Um, so uh, Bin Chan has an interesting background because before doing her PhD, she worked in industry research labs uh, as a, uh, as, <laughs> sorry, there was some background noise there. Um, as a um, wireless technology specialist. So she has quite a varied background. Um, and because of that, she's also interested in using online learning in novel applications in wireless networks. Um, and today she'll talk about regret bounds for differentially private Thompson sampling. Uh, welcome, Ben Shang, and I'll uh, let you go ahead. Okay, thanks for the, uh, thanks Nidhi for the, for the introduction. So today I will talk my uh, recent uh, work about the officially private Thompson sampling. So the very first thing is why so people are interested in privacy. So take myself for example. So uh, I interact with the internet a lot for very different applications in my phone. So I put all my health data record in the cloud and I do the mobile banking use my phone. And also sometimes I submit my dental insurance claim uh, using uh, an app in my phone. And also I chat with my, my friends where the social networks. And also sometimes I use Uber to go to either campus or go to shopping because I don't know how to drive here. So that means, so obviously, so the one that uh, uh, because I, I internet, uh, interact with the, the internet a lot and uh, for the companies that uh, develop all these kind of applications, they have, have a copy of my personal ses sensitive information there, right? And they may use my personal information to do the data analysis in order to, uh, uh, in order to offer better service for their customers. So obviously I, I want them to, to, to keep, uh, to preserve the privacy uh, of me, right? So that is why privacy is very important for, for us. And also at the company side, so privacy is also important. So I happened to read one article that, uh, it, uh, an article that according to a report in last year, by an international law, law firm that a huge amount of fines have been imposed under the uh, privacy regulations. So that means, so if the companies uh, fail to comply with the regulation, the privacy regulation, when they do the data analysis, so they may be fined by the government. So that, but still companies need to use the data set, need to use data to do data analysis in order to earn profit. So let me ask why we cannot, uh, I mean, remove the sensitive identification from the, uh, of the individuals from the data set, and then the company can use this kind of sanitized data set to do the data analysis. So the answer is sometimes, I mean, by simply removing the, the identifiable personal information is not enough. So there is one famous example for this kind of linkage attacks. So in 1997, uh, there is a MIT graduate student and uh, she could able to review the, the governor's medical records by combining two different uh, uh, sources of information. So why is a, a, a sanitized uh, data set, a public data set? And in this data set, so all the uh, identifiable sensitive information has been removed. And the other uh, source is that uh, by paying a small amount of fees, so the, the, the student can access to the voter registration records. And when they, uh, when they, she can buy these two resources of information, then she can review the, the medical records of the, 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 the governor. So that is why we need to use some advanced techniques in order to preserve the privacy of individuals, right? So this is what exactly the differentially private learning algorithm can promise us. So I use this uh, example. So we have, uh, we have a simple data set and uh, for each data point in this data set, it is only one tuple with two attributes. So the first one is the name uh, who has contributed to the data set and the other one is a binary bit. 
uh, indicating, for example, whether this person has depression or not. So either zero or one. So the differentially private algorithm so guarantees that. Uh, so no matter the uh, associated bit with an uh, individual is one or zero, it basically uh, has almost no impact on the output of the, the learning. So, so that means so it, uh, uh, this kind of private learning algorithm, so it uh, creates a trance for any individual to, so, to, say, to say no to. I mean, something like, for example, if we have an external observer, and then he can ask Alex, so do you have a depression? Then Alex uh, can, can say, no, I don't have. So why? Because Alex knows that. So whether uh, his associated bit is one or zero, it has almost no impact on, on the output of the, of the learning. So now uh, I will uh, go to the outline of today's talk. So the first, I will introduce the, the learning problem of Martin and Bandy the problem. And then for the second part of the talk, I will talk about the uh, differentially private template sampling learning algorithm. So I always use this example to explain. So what is the, the bandit feedback model? So suppose uh, we have a student and uh, she wants to work uh, in restaurants, I mean, during the, the summer term. And uh, that means she can pick up a, a restaurant to work with in from a set of restaurants. And uh, the amount of tips is considered to be uh, to decide which restaurant uh, she wants to uh, work in each shift. So what is the banding feedback model? So this student can only obtain and observe the amount of tips after working in that specific restaurant, right? She cannot obtain and observe the amount of tips if she uh, doesn't work in a specific restaurant, right? So this is the kind of the banded feedback model. So that means at the end of each round, each shift, only a limited amount of information is revealed by the environment. So let's go to the formal uh, problem setting of the, the monkey arm bandit problem. So we have a fixed arm set, a fixed, a fixed action set. And in each round, so the environment can generate a, a reward vector, which is hidden to learner. And simultaneously, learner can pull an arm from the, the arm set. And at the end of the round, so learner can obtain and observe the reward associated with the pulled arm, associated with the played action. So just like uh, in the tipping example, so the goal of learner, the goal of the student is to accumulate to earn as much as possible, right? By playing this game uh, over capital T rounds. So uh, for the stochastic bandit, so, so basically the rewards of a fixed app are ID, uh, ID over time. And there are a few uh, assumptions and notations for today's talk. So I use, I assume that all the rewards are Bernoulli. That means zero, one reward, and use this mu j to the mean reward of a, a fixed arm j. And also assume that the, the, the best arm is unique and the first arm is the unique best arm. And use this delta j to be, to be the mean reward gap. So, so basically, this delta z, the mean reward gaps, measure the performance loss. So if learner fails to pull the best arm, so what's the performance loss in a single round? OK, so typically, we use the, the pseudo regret to measure the performance of the stochastic learning algorithm, so which is defined as the performance gap between these two cases. So the first case is that if learner knows the, the mean rewards of all the arms, if the learner knows the, the environment, then she, uh, she can always put up with the highest mu reward, right? That means this capital T times mu one is the maximum amount of reward learner can accumulate. And the second case is the expected reward of learner's actual decisions, because in some rounds, learner may fail to pull the, the best up. So the performance gap between these two cases is defined as the pseudo regret. And uh, uh, just like uh, I mentioned in the tipping example in this uh, under the bandit feedback model, so in each round, so only a limited amount of information is revealed. So that means the learner needs to face uh, a situation uh, that in each round, it can only do one of these, either exploration or exploitation. So exploration means that uh, because the learner doesn't know the mean rewards of all the arms, so it needs to estimate the mean rewards of all the arms, right? So that means in some rounds, 
linear test to pull the arms that haven't been observed, um, that haven't been pulled, pulled a lot in order to estimate the mean reverse. And the exploitation means that remember the goal of learner is to accumulate the reward as much as possible. So in some runs, learner has to pull the arms uh, that is the highest empirical means in order to accumulate the reward to achieve the goal. And there are a bunch of uh, uh, good learning algorithms for stochastic bandit. So we have the upper bound based algorithms, we have the elimination style algorithms, and also we have the time sampling based learning algorithms. So I will skip the first two types of, uh, the first two types of algorithms and talk about the time sampling algorithm in detail. So uh, for the time sampling based algorithm, so uh, it is inspired by the, it is a kind of the Bayesian uh, style learning algorithm. So we maintain for each app, so we maintain a belief about uh, the mean reward. That means we, main, we have our belief that, oh, the mean reward is drawn from some prior distribution. And after we having an uh, observation of the, this app, then we can update our belief. So I use this uh, concrete example that uh, we have two plots here. One is the blue line, the other one is the red one. And uh, the blue uh, blue one is the, the our prior distribution about the, how the mean reward is generated. So that means we assume that all oh, the mean reward is generated from this, this, uh, this blue distribution. And after we have an observation of this arm, and then we can update our belief about uh, the distribution that uh, generates the mean reward. So that means we can have this, uh, the, the red one is the posterior distribution, right? And then uh, uh, this is the, the standard top to sampling algorithm. So basically we are checking two parameters. So one is the imperfect mean of um, the other one is the number of observations. So these two, these two parameters, so basically this is what, uh, this is all we can have. And then uh, based on these two parameters, so we can uh, uh, we can calculate the number of success of the Bernoulli trial, right? I use this alpha j, and we, we can also calculate the number of failures among all these uh, all these Bernoulli trial. And then we can generate a random sample from the posterior distribution, this beta distribution. So why we here we use beta distribution? So this is my understanding that. Uh, we want to estimate the mean reward, right, for, for, for each arm. And this basically, if the reward is Bernoulli reward, so the mean reward means, that means the, the success probability of the Bernoulli trial. So it, that is why it is natural to use this beta distribution to model the, to, to, to model the, 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 the success uh, probability of the Bernoulli trial. And also there is a very nice thing of the beta distribution is that if the prior distribution is beta distribution, the posterior distribution is also a beta distribution. So that means we don't have any computational issue here. And then for each arm, after we generate a random sample, say the JT from a posterior distribution, and then the learner can pull the arm with the highest uh, random posterior value. And then at the end of the round, so we update the empirical mean and also the number of observations of the, the pull down. So this is the standard time to sampling uh, learning algorithm uh, for Bernoulli uh, reward. And also, I, I also give a concrete example of the, 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 the beta distributions and these four plots are for the PDF of beta distributions with different parameters. So for the red plot and also the blue plot and the yellow one, so these three, they have the same amount of observations, but uh, with different empirical mean. So we can see that, so we, we increase the empirical mean. So basically the, the, the PDF is shifted uh, towards right, right? And the, but for the purple one and the blue one, so they have the same empirical mean, but uh, different uh, observations. So when we have more observations that uh, the, the PDF is more concentrated around the true empirical mean. So, it is a very a sharp. And when we have a small amount of observations, the PDF is more like a, a, a fat, it's a bit fatter. And uh, for the regret bound of time sampling, so, so basically it is skills with the number of sub-optimal arms and for each arm, so uh, for, for each, uh, for each sub-optimal arm. So this big O log T divided by delta is the, the uh, upper bound on the expected uh, uh, regret.
And now let's go to the second part of the talk, which is the differentially private uh, online learning. So, so in the context of uh, online learning, so we have a sequence of reward vectors that are input into the learning algorithm. And then the learning algorithm generates a sequence of actions, right? So uh, we say that uh, uh, we have a sequence of reward vectors from the first round until uh, up to round uh, T. And we also have another sequence we, we have we, have, we also have another sequence of uh, reward vectors. So the diff, uh, S prime, so the only difference between S and S prime is that they only, the reward vector only difference, uh, different from each other in one round, let's say in round R, the reward vector of, the reward vector uh, of this, uh, sorry, the reward vector of S and the reward vector of S prime, they are different with each other. And then we say that this S and S prime, they are neighboring with each other. And for the differentially private learning algorithm uh, guarantees that, so no matter the algorithm takes S as input or the S prime as input, the output in terms of distribution stays almost the same. So that means, so if we have an external observer and he can grab the output sequence, but he couldn't infer whether the learning algorithm takes S as input or S prime as input. So that means, so if uh, if each reward vector carries information for an individual, but uh, this uh, the information of a single individual cannot impact the learning algorithm a lot. So now uh, let's uh, go back to the, the standard, the non-private stochastic bandits a bit. So I use the, this picture to is, explain the, the design of the, the uh, non-private stochastic bandit learning algorithm. So we have a sequence of reward vectors that are input into the learning algorithm. And based on the feedback model, the bandit feedback model, then we, have, we can have a collection of the observations that uh, are revealed by the environment, right? And then, uh, we can check the empirical means of all the arms. And then for learners decision making, so they can, uh, I mean, no matter whether the they, uh, learner wants to construct the upper response or eliminate the bad arms or even generate the posterior samples, all these, are, uh, all these rely on the, the empirical means, right? So, and then the learner can output a sequence of the series. So this is a big picture of the, the, the non-private stochastic bandit, how to design the, the, the learning algorithms there. And then we'll come to the, the differentially private stochastic bandits. So we still have this collection of observations, but uh, then we want to uh, add some randomness, inject some noise uh, on top of this uh, collection of observations. So that means as long as we guarantee that the algorithm to check the empirical mean is epsilon dp, then we can claim that the decision of the learning algorithm is also epsilon dp. So why? Because uh, we have a nice uh, property of differential privacy, which is it is immune to poster processing. So that means as long as we guarantee that the input to learner's decision making is epsilon dp, then the output is also epsilon dp. So the constructing applicant response or animating arms or even generating the posterior samples, this can all be viewed as post processing. Okay, there are uh, uh, some literature work about the differentially private uh, stochastic bandits. And so far we have the optimal UCB based private algorithm and also the optimal elimination based uh, algorithm. But for the private time to sampling based algorithm, there is only one paper and the regret bound is, uh, is very suboptimal. Basically it takes the form of the log P cubic. So when compare it to the regret lower bound, it is very suboptimal. So I want to improve the, 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 the regret bound of the differentially private time to sampling uh, algorithm. Okay, uh, before I present the differentially private Thompson sampling algorithm, I want to recap a bit of the non-private uh, Thompson sampling algorithm. So we are checking two parameters and one is the empirical mean and the other is the number of observations. And then we can calculate the, the parameters of alpha and beta. And then we 
put uh, these two parameters into a beta distribution, then we generate a random sample, and then we learn our pools, um, and then at the end of the round, so we update the empirical mean and also the number of observations. So let me think, so uh, to have a private version of this learning algorithm, so let me think that it is very straightforward that instead of using the true empirical mean, so we can use a differentially private empirical mean. And then from the post processing, we can claim that, uh, oh, this algorithm is epsilon differentially private. Uh, I use this mu to the, to the, to the Z to be the differentially private empirical mean. So basically it is the true empirical mean plus some randomness, I mean, plus some ejected noise. And then uh, after we uh, calculate this differentially private empirical mean, and then we can have a differentially private version of this alpha and the beta, and then we generate a, a random posterior sample, and then we put the arm with the highest posterior sample, and then we update the uh, the differentially private empirical mean uh, of the, the put arm. So when we think this, this this modification is pretty straightforward, and when we think it works, but uh, I will say it later it uh, fails in some rounds. So why? Uh, because of the injected noise. So we uh, use the Laplace, well, we inject noise, and this noise uh, is drawn from some uh, Laplace distribution with some parameters. And I, uh, I put some plus here of the Laplace distribution. So we can see that, so when we have a large scale uh, sigma, so that means the, the Laplace distribution, so we, uh, we still have a big chance that uh, for the injected noise, for the ran, uh, noise random variable, that it can be very, very large or very, very small, right? So it means that uh, for the injected noise, I mean, for the differentially private empirical mean, so this is the true mean plus some injected noise. And uh, it will, because of the, the, the noise random variable, so it will result in the differentially private empirical mean either below zero or greater than one either be the, uh, below zero or greater than one. And uh, for the beta distribution, so for the, the input the parameters must be non-negative. So that is why, I mean, when the, even it is a low probability that the injected noise is very large or very, very small, but still we have a good chance that the, the parameters input into the beta distribution are not valid. That means if the, uh, the, differentially private empirical mean, the mu z tilde is below zero or greater than that, then that means the alpha, either alpha or beta, I mean alpha tilde or beta tilde, they will, they are not valid. So that means uh, in some rounds, this uh, straightforward modification will fail. So we need to use some uh, clever ideas to make it work. So uh, before I talk about uh, the my design of DPTS learning algorithm, so I want to say that uh, now we are still even differentially private bandits, it is still the bandit setting. It is still the uh, stochastic bandit setting, right? So we can still use the, the principle of the, that we need to be optimistic in face of uncertainty. And uh, for the top sampling based algorithm, so that means we want to reshape the posterior distribution in an optimistic way. So what does it mean? So uh, these two plots are the CDF of two posterior distributions. So for the blue one, is the, if, if the blue one is the original posterior distribution, we want to shift it to the, towards the right. That means we want to, that means, I mean, in the, uh, this plot, that means uh, we want to shift the, 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 the blue one to the, to the uh, position of the, the, the red one. We want to shift the, the posterior distribution towards the right. So that means uh, we can say that the, 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 the shifted one is a uh, first order stochastically dominates the, the blue one. And in terms of the PDF, so that means we can sh uh, sh uh, reshifting the posterior distribution towards the right, that means we shift the, 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 the PDF to, to, to the right. Okay, now let's come to the DPTS algorithm. So we are still checking two parameters. So why is the differentially private empirical mean? So basically it is the true empirical mean plus some injected noise. And uh, we also checking the number of obser observations and then we can reshape the posterior distribution and also make the parameters valid. So what does it mean? So we want to, uh, 
we want to add an extra term to the differentially private empirical mean. This is what uh, I call reshape the posterior distribution. Uh, and this extra term takes this crazy format. It is log the number of observations and also log t divided by the number of observations. I will talk about later why it takes this crazy uh, format. And uh, if the differentially private empirical mean plus this extra term is greater than one, then we want to round it to one. So that is why we have this mean here. Uh, if this dif differentially private empirical mean plus this extra term is below zero, then we want to uh, round it to zero. So that is why we have this max here. So basically this mean and max, uh, max want to make this music bar is in the range below zero, uh, sorry, it's in the range between zero and one in order to make the, the, the parameters that are input into the beta distribution valid. And then we can uh, generate a, a random sample and then play the, the, the up with the, the highest the posterior random sample. And also at the end of the round, we can update the differentially private empirical mean of the put up by using a hybrid mechanism. So later I will talk about uh, briefly about this hybrid mechanism. And from some the analysis, so we can claim that with a high probability, this music bar is no smaller than the true empirical mean. Uh, by the way, so the true empirical mean so basically uh, can represent the, the true posterior distribution, right? And uh, I also give a very concrete example about uh, what uh, uh, does it mean. So uh, we have this, uh, this is the PDF of two beta distributions and they have the same amount of observations but with different, uh, uh, with different uh, input parameters. So we can see that uh, so for the, for, the, for the blue one, so basically it's the true posterior distribution. And if we, instead of using the true empirical mean, if we use this mu bar, mu bar, so basically we have the red one and the red one lies exactly at the, 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 the right side of the, the, the blue one. And in terms of the, the PDF, so that means we shift the, the, also the PDF towards uh, right. Okay, for the regret bound of Thompson sampling, so uh, it uh, takes this form. So it is, uh, still skills with the number of suboptimal actions. And for the, for the regret, so we, uh, for, the, for, the, for the regret, so basically it, uh, it is the max, uh, it takes the max, max between these two terms. So the first term log t divided by, sorry, the first term log t divided by, by delta. So basically it is the, the regret we need to pay in the non-private setting. And the second term uh, highlighted by blue is the price, uh, is the regret uh, of introducing differential privacy. So when we compare this regret bound of DPTS to the regret lower bound, so we can claim that it is optimal, but up to an extra log log T effect, right? But it is still significant, significantly improves the existing log T cubic regret bound. And now I will uh, talk about uh, briefly about the hybrid mechanism. So actually this hybrid mechanism was first proposed by Chen ETL in order to noisily count the number of ones and the zeros in a binary stream, but we don't know the stream lines in advance. And also for the, uh, and also uh, it was also used by TD in the private stochastic binding problem. Uh, so the, the basic idea of this hybrid mechanism is to compose two differentially private mechanisms, which each preserve 0 0.5 epsilon differential privacy. And uh, in, in the context of this, uh, the, the stochastic bandit, the differentially private stochastic bandit. So, so that means, uh, we want, uh, we have this OJT minus one observations in total, right from the, the beginning until the end of round T minus one. We have this amount of observations. So by using the hybrid mechanism. So when we want to calculate the differentially private aggregated reward of all these observations. So we want to partition all these observations into two groups, into two sub sequences. So the first uh, two to S observations, that means from observation one up to observation two to S. 
they are taken care of uh, by a mechanism called the log mechanism. And for the remaining observations, they are taken care of by a mechanism called the binary mechanism. I will skip the details of the log mechanism and also the binary mechanism during, due to the time constraint. But I listed the key, uh, key facts there. So for the log mechanism, uh, when we want to calculate the, uh, the aggregated, uh, differentially private aggregated uh, rewards of all these two to S observations that uh, we have exactly S plus one noise random variables are injected. And each noise random variable is drawn from this uh, Laplace distribution. And for the binary mechanism, so when we calculate the differentially private aggregated reward, so we have at most S plus one noise random variables, and each is drawn from this Laplace distribution. And then if I use this calligraphic Y to be the aggregated injected noise by hybrid mechanism, and then we can have this inequality. So that, that means, so it is a low probability event that the total in, uh, injected noise is beyond this constant times log the number of observations log t divided by epsilon. So this is why this crazy uh, term, I mean, when we compute, when we compute this mu z bar, it, I mean, the, the crazy term uh, takes this format because we want to add this extra term in order to cancel the impact of this injected noise. And then for the last part of the today talk, I will give the proof sketch of the, the regret bound. So, so the very first thing is to identify the right sample complexity uh, of a suboptimal arm. So I, I use this category calligraphic LJ to, to be the, the sample, sample complexity of a suboptimal MJ. And the, for, there are also two terms in the max. And the first term is basically the sample complexity, even for the non-private setting. And the second term is, uh, is the sample complexity of introducing differential privacy. And then we can take the, we can do the regret decomposition. So uh, basically all the capital T rounds can be separated into two regimes. So the first regime is that uh, if a suboptimal MJ hasn't been, hasn't been pulled enough times. And the second one is that if the suboptimal MJ has been pulled enough times, so what's the probability that learners will pull this suboptimal arm again? And then uh, I have two claims. So the first claim is that for all, for all arms, including arm one, so it is a high probability event that this mu z bar is no smaller than the true imperfectly. So that is means we want to shift the posterior distribution towards right. And the second claim is that after a suboptimal arm has been pulled enough times, learner, I mean, after learner has have enough observations for this suboptimal arm So it is a high probability event that we want to shift the posterior distribution of a suboptimal arm, but actually we don't want it to be shifted a lot. I mean, we don't want the posterior distribution of a suboptimal arm to be very close to the, to the one of the best arm. And for the second claim, it guarantees that it is a high probability event that this mu z bar is smaller and equal than the true mean plus full delta z divided by six. So that means it will still have a small distance. I mean, after, even after we shift the posterior distribution, we still have a small distance between the one of the, the, the best arm. And then we can we continue decomposing the regret that we put these two high probability terms high probability events in the probability term and the, the O1 term basically is, uh, it is summation of all the low probability events. But so far we haven't used the, the posterior render sample yet, right? We haven't used this surface AT yet. And then we, we have already introduced a cutting point, the mu z plus four delta z divided by six. Now we introduce another cutting point, which is mu z plus five delta z divided by six. And then we can continue decomposing the regret by that whether this set of ZT is drawn inside in the interval between the mu Z plus five delta Z divided by six or mu one. So that means we can uh, decompose the, 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 the probability term uh, into two terms. 
And for the first one, actually, by using the property of beta distribution, then we can we can claim that it is upper bounded by O1. And for the second term, so the proof can be reduced to the non-private setting, and it is upper bounded by uh, big O log T divided by delta Z square. So uh, I will skip the details and only give a concrete example of uh, this one, why it is upper bounded by a constant. So I use this example. So we have this mu J equals to zero point, uh, sorry, zero point two. And we have this, uh, the mean, sorry, the mean reward of the suboptimal arm J is 0 0.2. And the mean reward of the best arm is 0 0.8. That means the mean reward gap, delta, uh, the delta Z is 0 0.6. And let's say we have this mu Z bar is 0 0.55. So then I, I plot the, the PDF of the, the beta distribution of this suboptimal arm J. So we can see that, so it is, very, uh, it is very unlikely that this shit ZT is draw beyond this 0 point, uh, 0 0.7, right? So it is a very low probability that this uh, set ZT is draw beyond this 0 0.7. And uh, now we still we only have one part left for the proof sketch. So this is this part. So I also put this, uh, this is set one t is smaller and equal than set z t because when in a round t, so when a suboptimal arm j is pulled, so that means the posterior sample of the best arm must be no, uh, no greater than the one of a suboptimal arm j. Otherwise, learner will not pull this suboptimal arm j. So now for this part, so for the proof, so we will use the, uh, this one, the, the property of the, the, the first order stochastically, uh, stochastic dominance. And then we can have we can have the ratio of the probabilities. We can have the ratio of the probabilities of the shift posterior distribution is upper bounded by the ratio of the probabilities of the true posterior distribution. And then by take a good amount of work and then we can re uh, reduce the proof to the non-private setting. And then we can reuse the, the llamas in the analysis of the non-private uh, temperature sampling and then this this part uh, is upper bounded by big O log T divided by delta Z square. So that is until here, the proof is done. Okay, now let's conclude about uh, today's talk a bit. So, so far, so by using the hybrid mechanism, so we can have a near optimal uh, learning algorithm for the visually private Thompson sampling. And actually last year, we also devised the, the the, the first optimal UCB based algorithm for the, the differentially private uh, stochastic bandits. So the key idea of uh, behind this UCB based private algorithm is that we use the, the idea of forgetfulness. So that means when we calculate the differentially private empirical mean, we don't use all the observations obtained from the beginning. We only use a part of the observations so that means we drop, we forget uh, some observations. So by dropping the observations, so we can control the amount of uh, noise random variable. We can control the amount of noise random variable when we're computing the differentially private empirical mean. We want to limit the number of noise random variable to one. And then we can have an optimal uh, UCB uh, based algorithm for private uh, stochastic bandits. So I'm wondering whether is it possible to remove the actual log log t factor for DPTS if we also drop observations. I'm not sure and I'm still working on it. Okay, thank you. This is all for this talk. Any questions? Thank you, Ben Shang. <clears throat> So thank you for your very nice talk. Um, I'm gonna ask if anyone's uh, in the audience would like to ask any questions or have a discussion. Thanks, Bingxiang. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions to Bingxiang directly. Or if you uh, don't want to, Ask the questions directly, you could put them in the chat box and we'll I or Nidhi can read those for Bing Shan. Um, 
So I have a little question um, just to get started. Um, can you go back to um, what kind of noise you're drawing um, at each ampoule? Okay, um, so since you don't know when you're going to stop pulling arms, how do you uh, take care of the privacy of counting in the sense that um, at some point, the amount of noise you're adding um, is just too much, uh, or is that a problem? I don't think it is a problem. So because, I mean, it's just like a, a, a something like, a, I think a for, whether for the log, log mechanism or binary, I mean, binary mechanism. So for each arm, so we have a sequence of observations, right? So we can label, I mean, we can give an ID of each uh, observation. For example, the first observation and the second ob ob observation. And then, and then based on the, 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 the the algorithm of the log mechanism or the binary mechanism. So every time when we have a new observation, so we can insert the observation in the corresponding space. I mean, the binary mechanism, basically it is a binary tree. We can insert the observation. And then based on the location of where you insert the observation, then we can grab the kind of somehow like the, the, the node that uh, it is, I mean, basically it is the parcel sound that uh, can, how can I explain it is? Oh, I think I have some the backup slides here. So I think uh, it is a bit, uh, oh, it is a bit, uh, I think I can, yeah, I kind of think I can use this one to, to explain. And uh, basically the, the first one is the binary mechanism and the second one it is more like the log mechanism. So every time we have a new observation of MZ, so we can insert in insert the, the value of the observ observation into a, a circle. So basically the circle is the place to hold the, the value of the observation. And then we can grab to calculate the differentially private impact. And then we can grab the, the, the one that uh, uh, for the hybrid mechanism. So just like I mentioned that we partition all the observations into two groups. And for this group that uh, for the, the, the binary, so, sorry, for the binary mechanism, so we can grab the, the tree that is not full. And for the log mechanism, so we can grab the, the arrays. I mean, if we use array to implement the, the log mechanism, so we can grab the arrays that are full. And then based on the where the newly obtained observation is inserted, and then we can grab the, the, the noisy sum, the differentially private sum. And the, the, the noise random variable is uh, is already in the field of the the the, the noisy sum, you know what I mean? And the, so if we give a label for each observation and the, based on the location of the observ observation, based on label of the observation, we know exactly which node, which noisy node we can grab from the, the algorithms to calculate the differentially private, either aggregate the reward or the differentially private empirical mean. Okay, so maybe, maybe my question wasn't clear. So you can yeah. grab already calculated aggregated noisy reward, mm -hmm. right? Um, but you don't know when your process ends, right? There's no fixed end to how many Oh, I, I see your point. So that is why we need to use hybrid mechanism because we don't know the last in advance. Right, so how, yeah. like how does that, um, like that limit on the noise that you add, um, even in the hybrid mechanism, what can you say about that? Like, is there a way to, to reduce that max, maximum noise that you're adding? I, I think uh, I think I, I can use this one that uh, for, uh, we only for the, the, the tree based uh, structure basically it is the binary mechanism right all the observations for this tree as plus one will only be we can only be used if this tree is not full so that means when you have more observations this tree is full then we don't uh, use the I mean for this mechanism we don't use all these observations at all. So we don't care too much about the when to end, I mean, the, the last. Okay, thanks. Maybe we can continue that. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Um, anyone from the audience um, have a lingering question that they would like to ask? <clears throat> I don't think we have any questions in the chat, so feel free to jump in, anyone. Or if not, we can always end a few minutes early as well. Give everybody 10 extra minutes to their weekend. Yeah, maybe um, we can do that. And um, so thank you again, Ben Chan, for your very uh, interesting talk. Um, this this overlap of differential privacy and online, uh, online learning uh, bandits. Um, there isn't a lot of literature out there on it. So it's uh, really nice to see um, some nice work that you're doing on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There is thank you, Bing Chen. Thank you everyone for coming today and to Nidia as well for introducing our presenter and helping moderate. And um, we will see everybody hopefully soon. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bing Chan. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank you, Sabina, for hosting today. See you next week.